Thank you very much. How many University of Chicago economists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Does anybody know? It's, a, it's actually zero because if the free market wanted it done, it would do it for them. <laughs> what is the market? The market in its purest sense is a place where people go to raise money to, to develop their ideas. And they use investment banks and banks to identify investors to make those ideas become reality. When I entered this field in 1983, I was looking at using the, social mar the capital markets to create social change. And the movement of the day was South Africa. And Desmond Tutu would say, we do not want our chains made more comfortable. Divest from South Africa. Pull out so we can end apartheid. That was my best Desmond Tutu. <laughs> so we went back, my partner and I, and we studied what we could do to help the big pension funds to divest. And we did a study that benefited the state of California, and they pulled out of South Africa. And we were very ecstatic about that. Then other states approached us and said, can you help us with divestment too? We said, this is great. But right around that time, we got a call from headquarters in New York. And they flew out to us in San Francisco. And they met with us in one of those face-to-face -face meetings. And the executive came in and said, gentlemen, divestment from South Africa is illegal. We said, well, wait a minute. We're a financial service company. We're servicing these big pension funds. We're helping them divest from South Africa. That's a great thing. And we can make money. And we can build these relationships and help them. The executive said, well, if you need to know the truth, the real truth is that we make more money raising money for Union Carbide to build another chemical plant in another part of the world than we do by working with your pension funds. And Union Carbide is on the list of companies that you're asking these pension funds to divest from South Africa for. And we make more money than we'll ever make servicing those wealth management clients of yours. So you, my young friends, need to go somewhere else. And we did. Fast forward to today. Has a transaction-oriented banking model changed? Certainly not according to Sean, high-frequency trading. Look at the financial crisis. They would rather leverage than lend. Leverage through credit default swaps, leverage through collateralized credit, credit default swaps and derivatives and subprime lending and putting those products together and selling them to their clients when they know that they're worthless. Are we the client or are we the target? We don't know. What else are they saying? They're saying that sustainable investing underperforms. Don't pursue that. When you ask them, can we do sustainable investing, we'll invest with our values. No, no, that underperforms. You know, limit your universe, limit your return. You've all heard it. I'm here to tell you that after 28 years in this field, one out of every $7 is invested using sustainable investing. $3 trillion. And that's not because society's become more charitable. It's because we make money. How many people here have heard of the Domini Index? A few, not many. Started by Amy Domini, Steve, Steve Leidenberg, and Peter Kinder. What they did in 1990s, they took the S&P 500 and they screened it for environment, social, and governance factors only. They didn't look at earnings, they didn't look at financials, they didn't look at anything financial. They only looked at the sustainability factors of these companies. They eliminated 250 companies of the S&P 500. That's limiting your universe. Then they added 100 companies in industries that were underrepresented so they could look statistically like the S&P so the data could be compared. And then they added 50 Ben and Jerry's of the world, the really strong, positive, socially responsible companies to the index. They had 400 companies. Here are the results. 22 years of data. You can see that the Domini Index, KLD, is up 924 versus the S&P at 864. That's significant outperformance. Little greater risk because you have smaller companies, which is what the standard deviation shows, which is let's say, well, wait a minute, you're taking, you're taking more risk, therefore you should get higher return. That's true. But the Sharpe ratio, which Bill Sharpe got a Nobel Prize in economics for here from Stanford, because the Sharpe ratio is higher than the S&P, it demonstrates that on a risk-adjusted basis, the dominant index also outperforms. 
So now on an actual and risk-adjusted basis, the Domini Index, which is the line in blue, outperforms. It's almost a million dollars invested in Domini would be worth a little less than seven million today, where the S&P would be a little less than six million. Significant outperformance. So the next time a financial advisor says to you that sustainable investing will underperform, it's almost like an expectation that you can get fair and balanced reporting from Fox News. <laughs> now why is this happening? Why is Domini outperforming? There's been studies from McKinsey and otherwise, and a number of studies that are out there. There's a lot of misinformation. The reason though is very intuitive when you think about it. It's because you're identifying stronger management teams. And what do you buy when you make an investment? Not gamble like a high frequency trading situation, but when you make an investment in a company, you're buying the management team. So managers that have strong sustainability factors treat their employees as assets rather than costs. They, they get better employees as a result of that. They have higher productivity. They have lower job turnover. Number one cost of business, job turnover. Inconsistent implementation of your business plan. So you have more productivity when you treat your athletes. You also have greater diversity, so you can tap the different markets. You have women throughout, both on the board level and upper executive level, and people of color throughout the entire company, not just in the middle ranks of the executives. So you can tap that diverse global market that exists. That goes directly to the bottom line of the company. What about from the environmental perspective? Well, they look at a finite natural resource and say, okay, we need to be more efficient about how we use electricity. We need to be more efficient about how we use these resources. Rather than produce a toxic that we have to watch forever, let's think about how we can recycle and use less. That directly impacts the bottom line of a company as well to make money. The other thing that ESG factors and sustainable investing identify are risks. Risk to brand. Risk to, risk to the idea of strikes and work stoppages through behaviors that are going on. And we'll cover more on that later. There are three other things on a macro level that are important so that ESG investing will continue in the future. One is cost price integration. This is a mega trend. The idea that cost of the product needs to actually bear in the price of that product so that externalities are not flying off the balance sheets of companies. Because where do those externalities usually land when they fly off their balance sheets and not absorbed by that company? Well, look around. They land on the taxpayers' balance sheets. We pick up the tab while shareholders make money. Is that a free market? That's a subsidized market. Bobby Kennedy says, you show me pollution, I'll show you a subsidy. We need to have a free market where actually these subsidies are embedded in the true price of what these products are. And this is a mega trend that's happening. It's gonna keep pushing that ahead. Capitalism has a dark, shadowy side and has a very bright side to it. The dark, shadowy side is its exploitative elements. It's the most exploitative machine on the planet. It exploits human capital, it exploits resources, and it ex exploits the environment. That's the dark side. But it also has a bright side that is far eclipses any other system out there. It's the most, and Silicon Valley represents that, it's the most innovative part of the economic system. It's the most entrepreneurial. It can solve problems. But we need to have regulation to define the playing field of capitalism so that it can create that kind of change. It works quicker than litigation or regulation, but you define it, you, then you let the entrepreneurs solve the problems to our society, and then you export those solutions and you create jobs, believe it or not. Regulation, so what's happening now though? Capital and corporations are busy gumming up the engine of capitalism because they're investing their money in trying to monetize assets that cannot be monetized without destruction to our grandkids and kids after that to the commons. So they're protecting those assets, they want to monetize those assets, so they're lobbying politicians that will set those regulations, and there's, and which, which means we need to get political money and union money out of politics altogether, so that, so that the politicians can actually represent the commons and future generations and make decisions along that line. Remember, back in the 1990s, mining, Congress actually passed a law that allowed mining companies to mine the Grand Canyon. It was stopped by an executive order by Theodore Roosevelt, who said, no, no, this is a national park. He made it a national park. So I'll believe corporations are people once Texas executes one. <laughs> so, so the other thing that's happening that technology can really help with is transparency. 
Because when we get transparency, we can understand where the company gets its resources from, ex extended producer responsibilities, the code word for that. But you can get full understanding of where do they get their products from, how do they make them. And they can report that to the customers who buy their products, and they can report it to investors so that we understand where the risks are if there's a carbon footprint. Because carbon right now is an externality, it's not priced. So reporting is important and transparency is important. We've all seen the effects of transparency, you know, obviously with technology and Twitter and social media, it helped with Arab Spring. So it can certainly help in the area of bringing a better understanding of where these costs are coming from and whose balance sheet that they truly belong embedded in. The third major issue is long-term incentives to match long-term performance and stewardship. That's a mega trend that's going to be pushed back more in the future as people look around and say, wait a minute, it's not just money. And it's not it, that these corporate CEOs are using these companies as fiefdoms to make money for the very short term. But that's not really what they're about. It's what they're involved in the community. It's a longer term process and the incentives need to be set up accordingly. The other thing capitalism has that's actually very helpful is that these companies are what? They're publicly traded. So who owns the companies? Who owns more shares than anybody else? Is it Bill Gates, George Soros? No, it's teachers and government employees. It's people like you and me. So through stockholder ownership, we can actually accelerate the pace of change. The Educational Foundation of America, which is someone who's been leading in the area of sustainable investing since the mid-90s, came to us and said, you know, we have this clean portfolio, but it's, but it's still producing issues that our nonprofits are cleaning up after. For example, the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition right up the road here was doing a lot of work with clean tech companies and clean up technology and saying, look, this is a great industry, but they're not recycling their e-waste, their electronic waste. It's ending up in unlined waste dumps over in China. So we looked at the portfolio and we filed shareholder resolutions with Hewlett Packard, IBM, Dell Computer, and Apple. Hewlett Packard and IBM already had e-waste recycling programs in place and we encouraged them to do more. Dell and Apple did not. So when my team went in and met with Dell Computer, we were expecting to meet with the environmental director, and in walked Michael Dell, to our surprise. And the way we present these arguments are into the benefit of the company itself. So our argument to Michael Dell was, look, at, we're Dell Computer. We sell direct. We know everybody that owns computers. How many people here have a closet full of old computers? Everybody. Well, what if we offer to take back our Dell computers? We'll lock in the next trade. What if we offer to take back everybody else's computers? We can expand our market share. Within six weeks, Michael Dell installed a recycling program for e-waste. It is now the industry standard. Now we move, thank you. Now we move to Apple. Apple's a little slow but special, okay, shall we say. Two annual meetings later, so you go to a dialogue and then you go to an annual meeting. Two annual meetings later, we get a meeting with Steve Jobs. We walk in, we have an 18-page document, we're presenting our plan for why they should be recycling. We get to page two, he's already flipped through all 18 pages, he chucks it back across the, 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 the table at us, he says, let me tell you what we're gonna do. Puts that one sheet of paper, slides it across, we're gonna go from 5% recycling to 30% recycling in the next three years. Great. We say, are you, are you doing that because you want to be a leader in this field and you feel like you'll sell more computers if you're green? He said, no. We said, okay, let's ask, ask the reverse question. Are you doing this because you're a lagger right now and you feel like it'll hurt your sales? He said, yes. And my stakeholders and customers who buy my computer and the shareholders deserve more. And I want to beat Michael Dell. <laughs> Apple now recycles 50% of all its computers. But more importantly, what you can see here is that shareholder actions and engagement and dialogues are a way to accelerate the pace of change. And EFA has embraced this. And so have other foundations like Wallace Global Foundation, Park Foundation, Jesse Smith Noyes, and others are using their foundations to accelerate the pace of change through using their portfolios. But we know we have to accelerate the pace of change. We know we need to move from a transactional-based banking system and financial system to the one that is transformative, that is based on diversity, sustainability, stewardship, and values. 
Investment banking needs to move where they raise money for a company and then they do McKinsey type consulting as they install environment social governance factors as the company grows. Then they need to raise money again and then they need to do more environment social and governance factors and help that company grow in the vision of the entrepreneur. Because the entrepreneur wants to treat their employees like assets and they want things that are sustainable. My hope comes in a story about a company and a six pack of beer. When Jim Koch and Sam Adams wanted to bring his company public, he said, I don't want my stock in the hands of the investment banking clients or a hedge fund that's going to flip it in a day for, to make a dollar. I want my hands, I want my, my company in the hands of who? His customers. So he sold his stock literally through the six pack of beer. He sold it at 15 bucks a share. When Goldman Sachs finally brought Sam Adams public, it went public at 20 bucks a share. That made several of the mutual fund and hedge fund managers very upset. At which point, Jim Koch got a phone call from one of the managers saying, I can't believe you let these cat and dog investors, his customers, in at $15 a share when I'm paying 20. I always get the lowest price for my investment banker. And I imagine Jim taking a sip of beer and saying, well, let me ask you a question. Are you a beer drinker? <laughs> fund manager said, no, actually, I prefer wine. Which point Jim said, I don't care about you. I care about my beer drinking customers. That's who owns my stock. That's who I want to have own my stock. The story gives me hope because Jim saw a system that was broken and he innovated around it. Here we sit in Silicon Valley, the center of innovation, where we see hundreds of thousands of millions of people moving their accounts to banks, then invest with their values and invest locally like One California, like New Resource Bank, like Good Bank that's setting up. And we're here in Silicon Valley, and we need our companies in the hands of our customers who want to own the company as investors. We need our foundations invest in a way that represents sustainability so we can have a planet for our grandkids and our great-grandkids. And we need to continue to develop tools to, to see greater transparency into where these costs are generated and how we can account them to various companies. We vote every day with our dollars. We vote by who we fund for politicians. We vote by what we buy at the stores, whether it's recyclable or whether it's organic, and we vote with our investment dollars. To say that investing money is, to, to investing money is only about making money is like saying we set up these companies because we only want to make money. We don't want to make products to be make the world better or for our customers to make their lives more productive or better. We're just doing it to make money. Investment is the economic expression of your thoughts and values. And we have to understand that and act on that. Thank you.